Is everybody happy? <laughs> and it only gets better because now we have our guest speaker. Uh, Pam, Pam Bro is a dear, dear friend of mine. Uh, I first met Pam, I think, back in the 80s. And uh, guess what we were doing? We were doing a, a skit of Godspell. And, and that's how we got to know each other. And uh, Pam has many uh, credentials. Uh, most notably, she holds her doctorate in uh, theology from uh, Chicago Theological Seminary, which she earned, I believe, it was 1999. And uh, but uh, back in in the 70s, I, I had the honor to hear uh, Pam's dad speak a number of times at the ARE, Harmon Bro, and he uh, uh, had this fire, this fiery passion about him when he'd talk. This real enthusiasm, like extremely inspirational. Just, to, just you really, you just love this guy. Well, guess where? Guess what Pam is like? She's got this fiery inspiration about her. The same, and you've got that gene, Pam. I'll tell you. And so, anyway, without further ado, let's let's give uh, Pam a fellowship welcome. Wow, so many memories are flooding through here. Not only did we do God's spell, but Chris, remember we did a Reader's Theater production of the Davidson Affair. And I was part of that. And I had on a black evening dress and I was pregnant with my daughter over there and I couldn't get the zipper up <laughs> all the way. And now she has my little Caledonia who's my first granddaughter and she's pregnant with a grandson. So, and my other daughter's pregnant in Singapore as well. So I'm like, wow, new life is coming. Even as those of us face elderhood and beyond. Uh, but this is truly a joy to be with Bruce and, oh, do we have full of God's spell and, and uh, Chris and everyone really, Susan, Sarah, and Sarah. Um, so uh, uh, I want to be so clear of how grateful and thrilled I am to be a part of this uh, celebration of this 50 years with you all. I have a short poem, which is Dabna's poem, it's a prayer. I choose to risk my significance to live so that which comes to me as seed goes to the next as blossom, and that which comes to me as blossom goes on as fruit. And for me, that's an organic image of what we are going to be looking at today. Uh, the topic it basically is, of course, looking at where we've been for 50 years and where we might be going, some ideas. And because that's a topic that's for months and years to come, uh, I'm going to just highlight the things that have really mattered to me. I started two small ch house churches uh, here in Virginia Beach over the years. I've been a pastor for over 35 years, sixth generation in my family. Uh, but now I'm broadening out and, and have been for decades uh, with so many other spiritual paths, especially earth-based spiritual paths and my beloved Lakota Indians. So, so uh, oh, right, oh, <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Uh, now, so I first want to look a little at tradition, I'm going to spend most of the time looking at just some suggestions and things that might get you even more stimulated than you probably already are with looking at the future and reviewing the past and seeing what will be uh, things that you would like to be involved in and present and offer. So I, I think of myself as more of an innovatist, more of a creative person than I do a traditionalist. And yet I must admit uh, that I am a traditionalist as well. I remember I was teaching at Tidewater Community College back in the 70s, and they, um, I was teaching English communications drama. And uh, the uh, higher ups told me, we're getting a new uh, electronic card catalog. Now you're speaking to someone here whose parents, grandparents, and on and on have been writers. And I love the smell of card catalogs. I, I could just sit there and smell them, their oldness, their, 
preciousness and everything. So I thought, all right, I'm gonna teach this to the students the new way, but I'm gonna go in and smell the card catalog whenever I can. And do you know what? The next time I went to the library at TCC, they had removed the card catalog totally. And that was really the first time I realized that change is the name of the game, not keeping things the same, but change. And it, but we say tradition, oh, tradition. And when we're looking at things, should we change anything? We say, now, wait a minute, change, uh, I'll talk about that in a minute, but a tradition is good. It's like the emotional glue that helps hold us together. It keeps us secure and safe and familiar. Uh, and we hear what people say, well, this is how we've always done it, right? You probably never say that here. Or don't fix it if it ain't broken. Or how about it's tried and true, it's always worked for us. So for 50 years, certainly the fellowship has done a great job of holding tradition with the big welcome, which you always have, the beautiful music, the soul stirring, uh, beautiful visualizations, the meditations that are powerful, the variety of speakers and subjects, the great energy, of course, singing, holding hands and being one body in the universe. So many precious things that you all have held on to. And I think again of another song and I have a master's in theater. So I come, I come well bringing these song titles up because the title of this sermon is The Beat Goes On. And you might know that the beat goes on as some sunny and chair. Most of us are from that era. Um, so this is what we're looking at today. But you remember Fiddler on the Roof. What was the name of one of the most famous songs? Tradition. Tradition. And he was one who was even more into tradition than I am. And tradition reminds us who we are and whose we are who we are and whose we are and where we come from. So important, these, these knowings. But we also know that our world is changing. In the 70s, I taught the book Future Shock by Alvin Toffler. None of us, I don't even think Toffler could have ever guessed how fast the future shock means too much change too quickly, too fast. And I believe we are suffering from that as a nation and as a world. And that's one of our jobs, I believe, right now in this challenging time and this time of opportunity in which we live. Now, if, if, we, do, if we do things only by ritual, as we know, not by ritual, by tradition, we know, we know that things can get stuck. We could get stuck. And sometimes they become meaningless, the things that we do. That's probably more true of Protestant traditions. I've served like a Yale University than here. But still, things as time goes on tend to get rote, a little dull. We don't really think about what we're saying or doing. And uh, there's a story, a true story about this, about a spiritual leader in a, uh, an African country who had a cat he loved so much black cat. He tied it up outside of his tent uh, all day long and played with the cat at night. And uh, after a while, many years, the man died and his disciples kept a black cat tied up outside the front of his tent. And then years go by and decades and there's always that black cat there. And finally, a little child says, mommy, why is that why is that black cat there? What's it mean? And the mom said, I don't know. We've just always done it. And that is the danger of doing too much on the side of tradition and not welcoming and being creative and innovative. Now, the, the most important question I see for the whole spiritual world and almost any tradition, although it's not true. In some places, young people are thriving to new religious paths, 
uh, Eastern pass again, some uh, new age pass, new thought pass, whatever you want to call it. They're making up their own. You can even see uh, echoes of the 60s coming back of worshiping together and dancing on the earth. The Indians, we become more uh, aware, uh, conscious of Native American power that they have kept sacred for us all these years, us white people, to be able finally, when we're able to open our hearts, ask forgiveness for what we've done to the Native peoples, that then we're ready to move on to new learnings and new partnerships. That's right. So the thing is, how do we get young people? And I think of my uh, Steve, who's my uh, son-in-law, we would used to have long conversations along with my daughter, Chelsea. But Steve was vehement when he'd say, I don't want to go. I would only go hear you preach, Mom Pam. I'd only go hear you preach anymore. But the rest of all the churches are boring. We don't want to be sitting there and having someone just preaching at us. We have wisdom too. We have spiritual wisdom and we need to find new forms, new ways that will incorporate this with our young people. So I'm just gonna be throwing out ideas here. You probably already thought of them, but these are what have made me think and reflect uh, preparing for this uh, talk today. So the importance of listening to young people, wherever they are, because it's even hard to find them these days in a church, in most churches, uh, listen to them. They've got great ideas. They have things that we need to open our hearts to and our minds to. And then we've got those of us who've been quiet all these years, those of us who love the fellowship, uh, both symbolic and literal, but who haven't shared what we would also like to see done here. And so we need to speak up and speak out. So we've got both, we need the importance of listening and then we have the importance of speaking out and sharing and making it a much deeper conversation than we have before, and it's already deep. I know that, but we've got to keep growing because what was it, was it Lennon who said? No, Dylan, probably. Dylan who said, if you're not busy being born, you're busy dying. Thank you, Spirit, for that. I, I think about the importance of ritual. I've spent my whole life, I wrote my whole doctor, doc, doc, it's coming doctoral dissertation uh, on the power of ritual to transform. And uh, so I'm very dedicated and have been my whole life uh, to the power of ritual, whether it's dance, music, drama, um, any kind of creative ritual. For ritual is a, a way of transformation of our spirits and our consciousness. It's not just something we do together which bonds us, which it does, and brings us beauty and happiness, it can, but its purpose is to transform our spirits and connect us with the divine in powerful ways. I, I think of things like uh, our songbooks, our songbooks. Now, I love our songbooks. I've been singing them for 40 years. Now you might say, hmm, so maybe that's something we want to look at to keep the best and favoritest of the songs. You all know, have, know them, have them. And then think, how can we bring new types of music that young people might enjoy and resonate? Now I look at my third generation over there, uh, going Harmon and June, bro, then me, then my kids and Callie and say, what would break her be joyful in worship? We've got to ask these questions if we want to keep growing. What would make her joyful and other children of all different backgrounds? Um, I also think of uh, Holy Communion. Um, just the other month, we celebrated it here. And I realized uh, that it, it felt to me, of course, I was trained for three years in a seminary in the, one of the best in uh, New York City. Uh, but if we do a ritual, again, like that black cat, we need to know why we're doing it. We need to have the narrative. We need to have the story. We can't just come in and bring the bread and wine and take it like we've done forever. 
you know, all of us haven't done that forever. Some people might not even know the Lord's Prayer, and I'm so happy that you all have included the words there for people. So these are just ideas. You get to flesh them out and make them, uh, if you choose to, to make them uh, something that you really want to look at and talk about, brainstorm about. So as we move forward, as we move forward to the next 50 years, some of us won't be here. Some of us may be reincarnated already. Some of us may be our own grandpa. I don't know. We'll have to see what happens. But we've just got to keep growing as we keep holding also in honor and respect the traditions and the knowledge that we have received from Paul and from his teachers and on and on and on uh, through the ancestors of all kinds of our ancestors. So as we look here, I see two, two way, different ways of looking at what's happening in our world, of course, which our spirituality and our community need to be a part. And that is the first one could be the great awakening, some are calling it, uh, some are calling it the ascension movement. Uh, and the idea being that now Atlantis has been unleashed. We need our 12 chakras instead of seven. I don't know what you're going to do with that, Sarah, but I'm sure you'll do something beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I, uh, we're moving, according to some teachers, spiritual teachers, from a three-dimensional world to a five-dimensional world. And the energy is increasing, the solar energy is increasing, the light within and without is increasing. We have helpers from every planet and every cosmos uh, that want to help us. But I've heard that they say, you've got the free will, human beings. You have to do the work. We will help you, but you are on. It's your time. So I think that's important. And it's important to remember to ask for help from the other realms because they want to help, but they have to honor our free will and can't just jump in here and save us. So that might, that's one strain I see happening. Another one is, uh, of, and I'm coming to the most exciting one for me right now, uh, having grown up in the church, grown up as a the practical theologian, uh, worked done so much work that uh, we know that there has been a schism, a divide between science and religion for 500 years, probably more. And now it's coming together. It's coming together. And what's wonderful is I was remembering, if any of you remember Mahote, and we're going again back 40 years, and I was preaching with him, and we sang a beautiful song together at the end of the service. Um, but um, Mahote... Let me see where I was going with that. Mahote. Uh, oh, even back then, even back then, I was reading as much as I could about the quantum physics, which I couldn't understand at all with, uh, for a long time with the theologian's brain. Uh, but um, I made up the word mysticist because the mystics, to me, right now are the scientists. The scientists are the ones seeing the mystery, the magic, and what is happening in the world, the ways, so many ways God is being revealed in creation. And so we've got this exciting time where science is open more and religion or spiritual paths are open more. And they're saying, look, 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 we can help each other. We can shine light together. We can explore together. We can we can really flourish more now that these two forces are joined together. And so that is so thrilling for me and for to know my granddaughter is going to be growing up with that uh, teaching. So this, uh, the most important thing to me about quantum physics uh, that takes over is taking over from uh, Newtonian physics, as I'm sure you all know, uh, that we used to think of physics as par um, particles of energy and our atoms, like a ping pong table match, really. That's how I did it. Uh, uh, the, the particles would bounce off of each other and they, they would interact that way. And they're everything solid, everything solid. But we know now that most of 
everything is energy and space, blank, empty, not blank, empty, fertile space, darkness. Oh my goodness, that's such a different uh, worldview paradigm than what we I grew up with. And so we have now quantum physics saying energy even emerges as particles and then goes back into the field, the quantum field and waits. And then as we come and participate, it emerges again in a new form or new connections. And oh my gosh, and even the moon, this made me really happy as a feminist uh, to find out that it's not just that the moon is reflecting the sun's light, which I grew up saying that's masculine, but the moon makes her own light. The moon now in quantum physics makes her own light, so always emitting it and withdrawing it back in, as well as reflecting the light from the sun. So there's so many exciting things I could share with you this morning, but I'm going to close with two stories that I, I think, to me, always being a theater person, I also have a master's in theater from Schiller College in West Berlin before the wall came down, so that shows my age. Uh, but it, it was an exciting time there. Um, and, and so I think story, and Jesus knew this, all masters know that story's the way, the real power to transform people's hearts. It's fine to have principles and ideas, but it's the stories that last, at least for me. So I'm gonna share two of the most transforming stories before I close. Um, the, uh, the first story is to illustrate how interconnected we are in this, what the quantum field calls this field of possibilities, or I love this, the unified field. Now, it does not mean the same field. We're not called to be the same. We're called, though, to be unified. That's what we're called to be. And so it just gives me... My Holy Spirit indicator is goosebumps when I think about this. So, so years and years ago in Chelsea, you know, I've told this, I'm a daughter of a preacher and you know, you always sink into your chair when your parent starts telling a story on you. So I apologize at the beginning, but uh, <laughs> Chelsea was uh, young and she's going to school in a new school and she was really having trouble uh, with uh, reading and things and she got so uh, upset with not keeping up with the class and she was very bright so I knew it wasn't that uh, that she started getting depressed and so we had just moved to uh, New Haven where I was the associate pastor at Yale and we only had one contact friend a pastor who said I've got the best pediatrician take her there I took her there to get her uh, tested and he comes out and says, she's making it all up. She just wants attention. And I was so mad. I was fuming because I knew there was something wrong and he missed it. And so then I go to the phone book because I said, God, what am I going to do? I know nobody now to ask. I, I, how am I going to find someone to help my daughter? She's suffering. And so I go to the phone book and it's got seven villages of thousands of names of pediatricians. And I'm saying, okay, God, okay. And I'm a pastor. I should practice what I preach. And so I said, all right, I'm listening. Give me a clue. Just give me help here. I really need your help for my daughter. And so I started looking down hundreds of names, hundreds of names, praying over each one. And finally, I saw the name Marguerite. And I thought, well, that's an interesting coincidence. Uh, now, this has happened in 2000. Uh, I said, that's a coincidence. My grandmother's name is that. It's not spelled the same, but hey, it's close. Uh, maybe that's the one I should call. And so I did a miracle of miracles that pediatrician took her the next day, which never happens to a new child. And she tested her and said, sure enough, she's got some reading disabilities and we know how to work with them to make them abilities. And so we are going to do that. Now that would have been wonderful enough. But the next day we were in Home Depot, our family, our whole family, and we met the doctor and Dr. Dillaway, we talked and everything, but said niceties. And then she left, turned around and came back. 
And she said, your last name is Bro, isn't it? Not the same as my husband's was. Uh, and I said, yes. And she said, do you know the bros in Chicago? And I said, I do. Almost all my relatives live there. And then she said, well, do you know Marguerite Bro? I said, she was my grandmother. She just died, but yes, yes, why? And she said, because 50 years ago, my parents and your grandparents were attaches for the State Department in Korea. And they loved, my parents loved your grandmother so much that when I was born, they named me after her. Aww. 50 years ago, friends, and a half a world away, and God had already been preparing a way, a way for us. There's so many possibilities if we give up our smaller dreams or our smaller ideas, if we can, ego can do that, then we're just amazingly blessed. I'll close with this. Because the most important thing, of course, is love. And you all know that, you practice it. You, and we know more and more how powerful love is for healing, for reconciliation, for so many things. So I want to share a story, and I'll close here with the power of love, not the love of power. That's what we've been running on for thousands of years. It's time for the power of love. So I was visiting my kids in Wisconsin where they lived then. Callie was only one year old. <clears throat> I was babysitting her so Chelsea and Steve could go to work. And I babysat her in the morning and uh, <clears throat> because I've suffered a lot of health issues late last few years. Um, I said, I better take a rest because I have to also watch her for hours of the afternoon. Uh, I got a phone call. My youngest sister said, listen, Pam, mom's uh, having trouble breathing, but the nurses say she's not going to die from congestive heart failure for probably weeks, maybe even a month or more. So I just want to reassure you that everything's going fine here. So I said, okay, good. And I had my little altar set up uh, for mom. And uh, so I thought, okay, I'm going to just lie down on the couch here and take a little rest. And uh, I started praying and I put on my mother and father's favorite music, uh, choral music, sacred choral music. It's all uh, vocal, no instruments. And they went there to study music after they worked with the Casey's, Edgar Casey and Gertrude, for a year in 1943, because it blew their minds that they were only 23. Now, uh, there you see the challenge and the blessing of youth. So uh, I lay down and uh, beautiful music started coming on. And uh, I was so peaceful. First went by, second music, third anthem started. Oh, I, I knew this anthem, this one. I had sung many times as an alto and choir. Uh, it's called Alleluia. And the only word in the whole anthem, Alleluia, Alleluia. And so, my goodness, uh, I thought, well, hey, I'm lying here. Might as well join in with alto. So I start singing with them because they're the best choir in the world, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, I started singing with them. And the Bases that are building up the bottom and the tenors are coming in and then the alto, the sopranos, and they start soaring with the music. And all of a sudden, I get whopped on the back with the biggest wave of energy I've ever had. And you know, if you've been hit by a wave out at the Atlantic, you know, where it knocks you off your feet, you can't find where it's up and down. That's the kind of energy it was. It knocked me totally out and I, I took a huge gasp. I said, what was that? And the thought crossed my mind real quickly. How do you breathe when you're dead? And the, that was bizarre. But then anyway, I'm out in the stars all of a sudden. I'm out in the cosmos and I'm floating. And what I want to share with you is there's so much love. There was so much love that I was being told there's love for every human being. There's love for every creature. There's love for every blade of grass. 
Don't you doubt ever the love of the divine creator for you or for anybody. Spread the news, spread the word. And I was so overcome with gratitude. I just started crying and got down on the knees of my heart. I, I couldn't even contain all that love. And it was so powerful. And the music's rising and rising. Alleluia, alleluia. So high and beautiful. It's like angels singing. And I'm struggling for breath and it finishes. Slowly it comes down, slowly and the, goes away. All that energy. And I thought, what was that? Within two minutes, my sister Allison calls and she says, Pam, the nurses were wrong. Mom just died. I said, what? How long ago? Two minutes. I said, oh my goodness. I was with mom at her crossing over. They now call it, um, I'll forget it now. Thank you. Shared, shared near-death experience. But I did not know that. And, and there's all different kinds. So I was separated, right? God somehow gave me the extra gift of going to the cosmos and receiving all that love. And so then I said, oh, my God, as a ritual person, we have to celebrate this. Mom died, and Mom was 99 and a half, so we didn't have to feel sorry for her dying. And so I said, now, they were gone. The parents were gone. I said, Callie was covered with yogurt and with uh, Play-Doh. And I said, oh, my gosh. Well, we've got to celebrate. So I put her in her uh, high chair, and I went to the to the refrigerator and I found an old, old bottle of wine. I said, I don't care, we're, we're celebrating uh, because my mother's June and then I'm the middle generation and she's Caledonia June. So we're celebrating. So I get Callie there and take the wine. I say a prayer of blessing for mom on her way. It's so glorious. I'm so high with love, it's incredible. And then I go, Chelsea's gonna kill me, but I'm gonna do it. I stuck my little finger in the wine glass and I said, Kelly, this is for you, Kelly, this wine in honor of your grandmother. And Kelly only knew one word as she licked my finger and she said it, more, more. <laughs> so that was such a joyous occasion, such a joyous occasion. So you can't, you can't, we can't lose. We can't lose, we can only win when we work together, when we love together, when we forgive, when we pray together, when we make up new creations of rituals and we practice the ones that we love too because they just sing from ourselves. Uh, and so, so that's the power of love, my friends. That's the power of the unified field. That's the power of the holy possibilities all around us and the angels and all the holy beings that are helping us if we invite them. And we must, we must in these times because we know enough, we've heard enough of the times of trouble and violence and dissent and divide. But I'm here to say this morning that the universe is calling us to our soul's purpose as we know. And we're all here, if we're still here, as Jonathan Livingston Siegel said, if you want to know if your mission is over on earth, if you're still alive, it ain't. <laughs> so that's our cue. And the universe not only calls us, but sings to us. And I apologize for using another Sonny and Cher song. Babe, I got you, babe. <laughs> I got you, babe. And so my dear, dear friends and, and companions on the journey for so, so long and to go on still, uh, I, I just celebrate and invite this com uh, community to keep going forward boldly and joyfully into the next 50 years. Amen, amen, hallelujah, and aho. Oh, oh, thank you.